just so you know, I came in like at the 11th hour. I didn't know that I was playing the role until like the Friday before I was going to go on set on Monday. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I had been told I was up for being a stand-in photo double. So I imagined they needed George in multiple places at the same time. Weird is great. Weird is great. All right. Well, we are so absolutely thrilled to welcome our guest of honor. He is the one. He is the only Jeffrey Weissman. Eh. And we are looking at a graphic, but it is a very beautiful graphic. Reveal yourself, sir. <laughs> I don't need to graphic. Oh my gosh. Oh, this is amazing. Wait, he's gone again. Come back. Come back. <laughs> Where did you go? Oh my gosh. I think I have one of those in the closet. I'll have to go grab my hoverboard. Oh. Oh, those are fantastic. Props on props on props. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey, those are amazing. Yeah, those are fabulous and I want some. <laughs> All right. I think I sell these for 15 bucks. Yeah. Oh, I love them. <laughs> well, I think uh, I know I need some of those sunglasses. Thanks Jeffrey, you thank you so much for joining us. We are so thrilled to have you. It's great to be here. Hi. Hi. And uh, we, we know that you have some footage and stuff that you're going to share with us. But uh, before we do that, we have a couple questions that we want to get into. So the first question to you, Jeffrey, very important question. If if you were to hydrate a pizza, where'd there be pineapple on it? Oh, hmm. Uh, <clears throat> hmm. Uh, we got Canadian bacon on it? Mm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. There could be Canadian then, bacon. Then, then you got to have pineapple. Okay, Fair. so yeah. can't have one without the other. Not really. No, that would be ludicrous. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe black olives. I don't know. Oh. Okay, mm. okay, we're getting fancy here. I, I'm a cheese kind of girl, but yeah, black <laughs> olives. Okay, no worries, like, no worries. I like the cheese on it too. I, uh, well, yeah, it, 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 uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> I've got these. I've got these. Uh, I, I'll be right back. Okay, go Ooh. for it. More props. Okay, while we're waiting for him to <laughs> rejoin us, <laughs> I like that he has a curtain. He has like a full set. Oh, yeah. Like, we don't know. <laughs> I like that he's got the full theatrical setup with the velour curtains. Oh, yes. oh here we go. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. Well, now that oh, we're all yeah. hungry, right? Yeah. We're, yeah. You know, this says hydrate uh, two seconds. I thought it was four seconds in the film. That's but, an even faster version. Yeah, yeah, Next yeah, thing I, you know, one second people. <laughs> Danica. Okay. All right. Next question is, so were you a fan of the first film before you joined the cast? Oh, yeah. 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 I, uh, in 83, uh, I did a film at the American Film Institute with Dan O'Hurley and Crispin Glover. And I thought Crispin was a fascinating actor. I got his number, tried to stay in touch. And then in 84, I, I uh, guest starred on some TV series like Scarecrow and Mrs. King. And then I got the role in Pale Rider with Clint Eastwood. And uh, that summer uh, in 85, when Back to the Future came out um, and, and Pale Rider was in post, I went to see Back to the Future. And I was already a big fan of, of Fox from uh, Family Ties and his other films. And, and then uh, of course, uh, Chris Lloyd from Taxi. And mm -hmm. when I uh, saw that, you know, the work, the comedy timing that everyone had, I thought in Leah, it was just, they were fantastic. And then Crispin shows up. I was like, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> and I was really proud of him. I thought he was, uh, you know, knocked it out of the park. He was nailing this wonderful, kooky, off uh, balance, nerdy guy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I was a big fan of the first film. Awesome. I mean, so, we obviously all were too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, so <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, maybe an interesting question for you, Jeffrey. So I am a theme park enthusiast, and one of the things that still pains me to this day is the fact that for some reason they decided to get rid of the Back to the Future ride at Universal Studios. I don't know who I need to write a letter to. Maybe Mr. Spielberg himself, well, whoever I have yeah. to contact. I so, worked, worked for Universal for years, uh, from '87 to 2001. If if you went to Universal in Hollywood and you saw Stan Laurel or Charlie Chaplin or Groucho Marx and had your picture with them, it might be me. 
<laughs> and and I did the groundbreaking for Universal Florida, and I directed a couple shows, the Blues Brothers and the um, doo-wop show out at uh, Mel's Diner in Japan, at Uni USJ, Universal Japan. And then I also taught all the lookalikes and the fuzzies, uh, you know, how to work a theme park. And I remember, you know, they did, they, I think these, the new young execs that come in, uh, you know, if, it's always a constant power struggle between the, the mucky mucks there, it seems. And, uh, you know, if they, they deem something's hotter in the moment than yesterday's <sighs> ride or show or whatever, they, they butt heads and whoever has the more, more clout trumps them. Oh, I don't mean to use that name. Uh, <laughs> and, and they, you know, they have their way. I remember, you know, oh, uh, there, there, there was like the Century Oak on the Universal Tour in L.A., that disappeared overnight and those are protected trees <laughs> and they wow. took them down overnight i was like where did that beautiful tree go it was like a 300 year old tree and that's where they put the back future ride in which now has become the simpsons ride which is probably going to change into yet something else i you know yeah what the, whatever is fresh whatever is happening you know that's what they got to be with and it's kind of unfortunate they mm -hmm. they've really lost some some of the old hollywood chair you know would they do tributes by having Charlie Chaplin in the park. I don't think they have Charlie anymore. Or, you know. No, I, I, I think I've seen Marilyn Monroe recently because uh, I'm not I'm not too far from Universal Orlando. So, you know, we, we popped down there a couple times before before COVID happened. But do you have any recollections of the ride at Universal Studios or getting to experience? Well, you know, one of, the, one of the first things I looked at was, you know, I, while I was in the line taking the ride, um, was uh, the the little pre-show videos that they'd show. And I remember they, you know, Dr. Brown's Institute of Future Technology had things like, you know, showing pizza hydrating and so on and so forth. And there were my feet. And I was like, oh, good, I'm in this. <laughs> hey. I'm gonna get a, some money, some residual or something. And then I think I was there was a little bit of me in another quick shot. And I was like, yes, I gotta get some money. And I waited and waited, no money ever came. So I. I wrote the Screen Actors Guild. I said, I think I'm owed some money because I'm in the footage while people are waiting in line. And uh, they went to Universal and Universal came back and said, no, no, well, he's not in there. And I was like, yes. And I, I went and videoed it and showed them. And so that's my feet. I'm hanging upside down, that's me. And uh, e eventually um, the union kind of sided with Universal and said, well, oh, it's considered an advert promoting the film. I was like, no, it's helping tell the story of the ride. <laughs> Come on. And by then they'd cut me out. No way. Well, you know, it's theme park. What are you going to do? There's a, when I started at Universal 87, I think we had three bosses. There was the main boss and a couple of assistants. And that was it for our whole entertainment department. By the time I left, there were about 20 bosses. Oh. And, yeah. and middle manager. It was, he was like, uh, everyone trying to they were kind of complexify, complex, uh, make things harder, ma make their job mean something by making things difficult. It was How like, I got to go. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. But, and I mean, like, so Danica and I, you know, we, we love The Simpsons, but I just think that there's something like we want the classics, you know, yeah. we want to live these, these things that we grew up idolizing mm -hmm. and watching. I mean, it's hard I, to I love that ride, but I, I actually got whiplash a couple times riding it. Yeah, I won't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, they, they take out the ET ride. They take out you know all these. Uh, you know, it's it's a turnover thing because they're following like your show, pop culture. Right. They want to know, well, they want to know what's happening. Uh, go with it and right. uh, be be in the now. I I think E.T. is the one ride that they're not legally allowed to touch because then Steven Spielberg said he would pull all his properties off the park. So that that's the one that I don't, at least in, in Orlando, that's not going anywhere. Yeah, I think they closed it in Hollywood. Uh, yeah. What's happening? <laughs> My childhood. Uh, I'll, I'll be right here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, let's switch gears just a little bit. So um, kind of in keeping with this, but I was wondering what is the most challenging aspect of participating in Project 88? And for those of the viewers watching now, if they don't know about what that was, can you explain that a little bit? And what was the most challenging aspect for you? Yes. 
Okay, so um... <laughs> you know this is this is my uh, pandemic fur, by the way, and and when the the lockdown exactly. started, uh, it... thank you. It's yes, oh, yes, very stylish. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm actually growing it so I just have the mustache long because I'm gonna uh, do a, another Mark Twain project. Oh, fabulous! But uh, at the beginning of the the uh, pandemic, I was approached by uh, Uber fan Kevin. Uh, who, who, he, he's uh, Kevin Bosch is like uh, a super Back to the Future fan, and he was like, Jeffrey, can you be in this, this project with me? And I said, what project? Uh, he said, well, uh, there's a guy who's putting together a remake of Back to the Future Part Two, and he's calling it Project Eighty Eight. What he did is he took the film and cut it up into eighty eight different scenes, mm -hmm. and he then assigned it to people from around the world. He got over three hundred people from nine different countries to shoot these scenes. And they, because everyone was in lockdown, they had to use whatever resources they had in their home, set decorations, props. Uh, some used their children as characters, some used their pets, some used animation, claymation, whatever they had. Clever. It was clever and, they, and everyone had just pretty much a week to do it. Wow. And, and uh, this, uh, it was Taylor Morton, the producer who edited it all together. It took him longer because people, weren't delivering on time, of course, so that things stretched out. But the final, the final product, even though it's kind of, uh, there's some pro stuff, a lot of amateur stuff, and and a lot of fans came together, and it really, it I think is wonderful. And and you can find it on YouTube and also at Project88.com. And so that's the remake of Back to Future Part Two. So premiering day after tomorrow on Saturday is Project Eighty Five. Oh, where a bunch of fans oh. came together and have remade part one. Oh, wow. Very cool. <laughs> Good timing. Yeah. Good timing. So oh, I can't wait to watch. Uh, Project 85 on Facebook, and they probably have a website and all. I'll get back to you. Maybe I can you can put it in your notes to your fan base, whatever. Yes, That's thank awesome. you. Definitely. And then I wonder, did we attempt the third part? Because I, I look really good in a cowboy hat. That's coming. <laughs> That's coming. We should uh, get a hold of Poppy or Ari. Uh, you know, some of the uh, organizers of Project 85 are planning to do part three. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. That's great news. So obviously, um, Jeffrey, you're part of one of the biggest franchises in, in existence. But what would you say? Woo. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, what do you think is your, your biggest takeaway and learning experience from being part of this incredible cast and crew and being on set? Well, uh, hmm, there's a lot of takeaways. That's a kind of a loaded question because there's so much controversy with what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I would take away, you know, make sure that production has the rights to mm -hmm. the likeness of another actor if you're, they're gonna make you up to look like them. Uh, make sure you're not an asshole, um, you know, Crispin rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, unfortunately, on the first film. He, he he didn't hit his marks. He would disappear. He wouldn't let people trim his hair. He, he'd flip out. He'd made demands that they weren't ready to, you know, he and Leah painted a painting together in rehearsal and brought it, Crispin brought it in and said, I want this in the McFly home. And Zemeckis was like, I have art directors have already said this. You can't do that. You know, and he threw a fit. You know, so you know, as much as I think he's a great talent and a really, he's a nice guy, really. Um, he kind of shot himself in the foot by alienating people. And then when they, you know, offered him the role to return, uh, and just so you know, I came in like at the 11th hour. I didn't know that I was playing the role until like the Friday before I was going to go on set on Monday. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I had been told I was up for being a stand-in photo double. So I imagine they needed George in multiple places at the same time. Okay. And... Uh, like you know, when when you have Marty uh, rocking on stage at the uh, enchantment under the sea dance while he's up on the catwalk, you know, I, I figured they needed George in multiple places. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I I went through uh, casting and meetings and then prosthetic fittings and and body cast fittings for special effects, and it was my makeup artist who said, you know, Crispin's out. You're going to be George, and I was like, what? <laughs> And, and I, because I couldn't imagine them making the film without him. Hmm. And I figured because the star was rising, 
you know, from River's Edge and uh, other films that he did some really great work in, that uh, he couldn't get out of another project uh, timing wise. They just wouldn't hold production for him. Uh, little did I know, <laughs> uh, you know, because they, because he wouldn't, and a lot of people say, you know, oh, they hung him upside down to obscure that it was a different actor. And I was, no, it's not the case. I actually recently learned um, because Crispin wouldn't hit his marks, he'd overshoot them for camera. They huh. wrote it to uh, that George had his back uh, knocked out while he was golfing on the uh, golf course by a flying car that fell out. So I had so Crispin is, or George is hung upside down through the whole thing, and that way Bob Z and Bob G Bob Gale have him on a track, and he cannot veer from that track. He'll be set on those places, so camera will always have him in focus uh -huh. or in frame. How clever! Yeah. Yeah. Well, I ended up, of course, taking that torture. <laughs> and uh, and also Crispin, I think uh, even though I know he wanted a million, I think they offered him a hundred thousand or whatever. Uh, but he also wanted script approval, and I don't mm -hmm. think they were going to give him that. So he kind of tied his hand, tied their hands. Uh, unfortunately, I was kind of in the middle of all this, and I didn't, yeah. you know, know really until while we were shooting, uh, Spielberg came up to me at, while I'm in the body cast to do the spinning for pizza shot, which is cut. It's in the deleted scenes. Um, Spielberg said, so Crispin, I see you got your million dollars after all. <laughs> and I was like, uh oh, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> oh, dear. What a, what's going on here? Wow. <laughs> so it, was, it was kind of hurtful to me because, uh, you know, I was a fan and a friend of his and then being on this huge film was so exciting for me. And I, I love being a part of that ensemble and the great talent, but at the same time, they also wanted to keep me a secret. So he didn't sue. Of course, he. How could he not? They made me in the prosthetics to look so much like him as young George. So, uh, you know, he called me after part three came out and said, you know, what they did to me was unfair. And I said, yeah, I think so too. You know, and uh, so he he got his three quarters of a million in an out of court settlement, and and I get to be a part of this trilogy. And even though they tried to keep me from promoting myself by withholding footage and and photos and stuff. Uh, I ended up, of course, being discovered by the fans, you know, with reunions and DeLorean conventions and so on and so forth. So I guess my best takeaway is trust the fans to appreciate you. Hollywood, they don't really care. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair. <laughs> yeah. But like any professional actor, you went, you did the job, you know, and, and now you live to tell the tale. Yeah. Long days, you know, in the McFly home of 2015, uh, I remember one week. I had a 19 hour, a 21 hour and a 26 hour long day on my time card. And, you know, I think I worked for six days that week and uh, hanging upside down for most of those days. Wow. But how was craft yeah. services? Was it good? <laughs> they served yeah. you good food at least? Oh, you know, the food was, was darn good. Uh, the, the crew was magnificent. I had, you know, special handlers from ILM for, for my effects and, took good care of me. Uh, everyone was actually very nice and very wonderful to work with. I I rarely saw any friction. You know, Ken Chase uh, mouthed off during uh, first day of shooting or, yeah, uh, to, you know, when AD came in and said, well, when's he going to be ready to, with my makeup? And, uh, and Ken said, he'll be ready when I'm done with him. And he got fired. You know, <laughs> you don't mouth really? off. Really? Oh. You know, it, it happens. Wow. You know, people... People will get cocky or whatever, you know, it's, you just do your job and, and make the best of it. And because it is a team. I mean, those days that we're working into the 24th hour or something, you know, people are fried and doing their best and running on fumes and stuff. And, and it's mainly, mainly because either a special effect isn't going right that you're there or, uh, you know, we're waiting for Michael to switch character makeup and costume so we can get that last shot with so the special effect for him playing three three roles is precise and, and works you know it's uh, people you know got to work together and got to support each other if, if you're gonna uh you know be ornery it's, you're gonna pay for it and and you know i pay for kind of speaking out they I won't go any further with that. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I get to do these reunions. This was a shot from uh, the, our first reunion in 2008 at okay. the Hollywood Bowl. How it, fabulous. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love this so much. 
first time I saw Michael, you know, with his uh, Parkinson's, uh, the effects of his disease on him, and it really was upsetting to see it up close and personal because Michael's such a great guy. And uh, it's so heartbreaking that the, the, the disease should pick on him. I, I kind of felt like maybe it came on early because he did work so hard. I remember talking with Mike during production. It was like, you're shooting the last season of Family Ties all day and then coming and working with us all night. When do you sleep? And he said, oh, sometimes in the dressing room, but usually in the limo in between the studios. And wow. like, you know, he worked so hard and then continued on part three nonstop. And, and Seamus was originally to be played by Crispin. Um, so, but he didn't come back. So they used Michael playing that role as wow. if he didn't have enough to do. Right. Wow. And yeah. then he got accidentally hung. You know, I, Michael went, of course, through a lot of stress during that both shoots. And, I, and it was shortly thereafter that his little finger started twitching. You know, the Parkinson's came on. And I think it was just from overwork. Oh, goodness. I, I mean, I yeah. I, my, um, my dad just finished reading his most recent book, said it was really wonderful. And um, I, I know that he's retired once again, but, you know, his legacy lives on. Like, you know, I, I'm so honored that we get to watch what he created in such a, you know, I want to say a short period of time, you know, because he's it, still a young man. It was fascinating to watch him work, too. I, I teach acting, and I'm blessed to have worked closely with some really fine actors from Michael Keaton and John Lithgow to Michael J. Fox and Clint Eastwood. You know, I, I've, I've been able to look at them on set in front of the camera and watch their prep and so on and so forth. And Mike's kind of a formulaic, but you can't really tell it's a formula, but knowing how he honed his craft doing sitcoms like uh, Family Ties and such, uh, he's got this kind of, I want to say formulaic, comedic thing he does, but it's always connected to this authenticity, this truth in him. And his timing is often impeccable. And Mike is the only actor I've seen on set call cut during a shot. Uh, unless, you know, an actor is directing it, like with Clint, he was directing and would mm -hmm. call cut, even though he's in front of the camera. But Mike called cut on this one shot and saying, cut, cut, cut. I, I didn't even believe that myself. Hmm. Well, I guess isn't going to argue with that, you know. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> a, a really consummate pro, too, and, and a nice guy on top of it. Good combo. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love hearing that, too. Yeah. Well, um, I was wondering if there was actually another uh, trilogy or film sequel that stands out as one of your favorites just to watch. Ooh. Well, uh, hmm. I mean, there are too many to choose from, of course. There's a lot. A lot to choose from. Uh, you know, I, hmm. I'm i kind of a, I don't want to say a wimp, but uh, horror films aren't really my bad. I, I like some horror films. The gratuitous blood and, and scares are kind of- Not uh, for you. Not for me <laughs> so much. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, kind of a softie. Um, I liked, of course, the, uh, the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy and uh, oh gosh, you know, to, hmm, I'll leave, leave it at that one. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, I mean, oh, no noble answer. choice. Yeah, it's a very yeah. good answer. Yeah. And, and yeah. now you're going to speak for us in Elfish, right? Seven. Sorry? I said, now you're going to speak for us in, in Elfish, right? Is it Elfish? I should be friggin' the hoo. I should be salada. Right. Um, sure Pineapple pizza. Funny. Right, exactly. That's <laughs> 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 the olive place. Put it on this one. <laughs> so, uh, but before we we kind of move along, because I mean, obviously yeah, you're a very prolific uh, <laughs> actor. <laughs> Come back now. Um, is there anything that you wanted to share with us? Maybe things that. Oh, are we cheersing? What? Oh, oh, ah! oh! I see Rosa. I was like, what are we drinking? But it's you inside of a. a there we go. Yeah. Oh yeah, there he is. So drink. My action figure. There we go. <laughs> Look how cool it is. I this was made by a fan. I I am so blessed nice. that every once in a while, uh, fans uh, turn up full art. <laughs> Look at that. And uh, I'm not. I sometimes have to buy it, but um, still, you know, I get uh, at different shows, artists oh, doing renderings. Uh, I, this kid, a, a 14 year old kid down in uh, Australia, did a drawing of me as young George. No one ever does me as young George because that's, but 
uh, he, it came out great. Uh, it's, it's been really fun for me to, uh, you know, reap those uh, rewards. There's one guy, uh, Charles Ch Chaz Alexander, who posted a, 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 an old 2015 George hanging upside down action figure. Uh, that's part of his. He's made uh, all the characters from Back to the Future, and and his looks like the one uh, super fan Brad Fife made this one. Um, and then there's a guy. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Necessary things. Whatever. Whatever he, he on Instagram. He he's making. Uh, action figures of everything. He, did, he just did Bing Crosby and, and David Bowie, you know, for, for the season. Um, necessary things, unwanted things. My, anyway, uh, remarkable artist. And what he did with the old George action figure, like the one that Brad made and that Chaz Alexander made, is that he put it in the packaging as if it was a real action figure from <laughs> Funko. And on the back of panel, he put all the, uh, the ruling from Crispin's case. On the packaging, so I've been writing a lot. I said, "I want this. I want this. Can I get it?" He doesn't respond. Uh, he's oh, an he's oh, an come on. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think one of my favorite things, you know, obviously in this insanosaurus world that we're in right now, is when we are doing, you know, these virtual things that you can share something like that with us because, you know, when you're at a convention or something, you don't necessarily carry around all your collectibles. I, I do though. I well okay. no. I mean I I'll sometimes bring the mind reading helmet or or the hoverboard or the glasses because people love to play, and everyone's cosplay. I mean I love seeing the cosplayers. I have been on a, a number of events that are generally fundraisers for Michael's charity. One called uh, Back to 1885, which takes place where we shot Part Three up in Sonora in the uh, Gold Country. And there's a, it's like a whole week of celebrating and everyone dresses up as a different character from the film or, uh, you know, so cool. does the, the, the zip line or shot, shot of themselves in the DeLorean on the train track being pushed by the, the real train from the film or uh, the uh, We're Going Back event that's gone on a couple of times now. Uh, over the course of the week, you can hoverboard or, uh, you know, I got, I have wonderful pictures of me being held by the collar by Griff Skang, a uh, wonderful uh, cosplayer is doing that. For me, that's so much fun. And and also I've several friends now with Time Machine DeLoreans. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't work a lot. I work some, but I don't make a lot of money. So from time to time, they'll call me and I'll play Duck Brown. Oh, cool. I love that. Oh! <laughs> well, that's the second gig I got uh, during lockdown when the pandemic started, uh, a friend of mine on Facebook, uh, Ian Drescher, who's a writer, had posted that his version, his Shakespearean version of Back to the Future was being produced by this company out of London. <laughs> I was like, wow. So I wrote him because I, I need to work. I, I have to play. I'm an actor. It's in my it's in my genes or in my muscles. And I got to exercise those muscles. So I wrote him. I said, is this? Casting? Are you ca can? Uh, is it open to casting? And he said, I don't know. Here's the casting director's uh, email, and so I wrote them, and they realized who I was, and they said, We'd love to have you. Uh, they were a company out of London who were ready, to, really, with Zoom productions they've been developing since before the pandemic, and uh, in fact, they've been doing, they did all of Shakespeare's canon in 36 weeks, a different Whoa. day every week. Yeah, that's, that's whoa. Intense. <laughs> so they said, what part would you like to play? I said, Doc Brown? You got it. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so here, here in my living room, uh, my wife was my my costumer, my set decorator. There's the picture of me as Doc. And oh, okay. so as an uh, Experian Doc, I would wear that only with a ruff and speak as if she, Doc's lines were written by Shakespeare. Oh. And the, you know, the, the slide for life, uh, the clock tower slide down the wire here in my living room on a hanger on a wire. Yeah. And and when it was time to climb the clock tower, you know, she turned the camera this way and I'd get on the floor and, <laughs> up the building and you know, it was really great. And the company, you know, I'm working with people from around the world. We have actors uh, literally in Canada and Australia or the Caribbean, you know, working from everywhere pulling this all together and doing a fantastic job. It's it's online too, if you want to see it. Uh, that's called uh, 
uh, get thee back, get thee back to the future, I think. And it, I T S M G O, the show must go online is the name of the company. They did a, uh, a non-binary female cast of the Scottish play. The, the, uh -huh. the Wait, yes. It came out fantastic. Mm -hmm. And they've learned how to use Zoom by, you know, it, put your own hands on your neck for a second. And yeah, I'm, ch I'm choking you now. There you go. There we go. Uh, uh, <laughs> they're, they're figuring out how to do Acting. fight choreography through the camera through Zoom. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And kissing, you know, and, <laughs> and, and they're doing a really great job, and it's it's lovely to see. I've been sharing it uh, some of those methods with the actors gang out of uh, you know, Tim Robbins group in in LA. They have the cabinet of oddities that I've joined a, a few, and and I've been teaching them some of those tips too. And it's coming along. It's really fantastic. Fun. Oh, that's so wonderful. Uh, so before we move on to maybe another. Um, project i wanted to briefly touch on the um the makeup process that you went through in order to fully embrace and become george yeah. fly well uh i tell you what i'll show you uh some of that okay i have um footage from the making of documentary let's see it uh, well, give me a sec because I gotta I gotta set it up here. We're on okay. your time, friends. We're we're well, good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, are you seeing my desktop? No. Let's no. See. There. Oh, now yeah. we are. You are now. Yes. Okay. So let me uh, pull this back. And make it full yeah. screen if you can. Yes, ma'am. Pull your section. Right. So uh, this, you know, like I said, they were trying to keep me secret. And so this was all footage that was in the making of documentary that was cut. And here you can see in the foreground, Nancy Vasta and Sonny Berman in the uh, yellow shirt of the Berman brothers. His brother produced all the Star Trek Next Generation, all the Star Trek offshoots, makeup family legends. Um, really lovely people in the background there. The redhead guy is uh, Mike Mills, who was the foreman on Beetlejuice. I, I think that's Kenny Myers, whose back is to us, or Marvin Westmore. There's Leah. You can see Leah in the next chair over. So it took us, if I wanted to be on, uh, my call was to be on set by 9 a.m. I'd have to be in the makeup chair probably by 4 a.m. So, uh, you know, I'd have maybe makeup applied for two and a half hours or so and then take a half an hour, 45 minute break for breakfast and then come back and then get my, my hair and colored and so on and so forth. So it was yes. uh, basically four hours a day to get into that makeup. Holy heck. Wow. And and what about the process of removing it? Was that a quicker process, I would hope? It was a quicker process. only took an hour. Mm -hmm. wow. It's still a fairly long process. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how many pieces were applied? I'm seeing a chin prosthetic, it's looking like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the chin, the neck, uh, the skull cap. Uh, I think I had my own forehead. Look at you. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. A little creepy. My, my Freddy Krueger lip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Way less scary than Freddy. So you see, they were kind enough to let me stretch once in a while. What Here's my girl uh, touching me up for uh, young George. Oh, this is so cool. Yeah, I felt sorry for Leah having to kiss the mask. <laughs> wow. That's so amazing. So you can see how, how hard it was just to even drink water there. Oh. <laughs> Gosh. That, That's, that is extensive. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Sure, That's sure. That's really I, neat. I'd <laughs> like to get it out there so people can see, you know, what I had to go through. And and it, during those, you know, uh, Enchantment Under the Sea Dance re remakes, remaking that scene, uh, all the early takes when uh, we'd have to do our business, Zemeckis would, would call 
uh, Crispin. He would, he would call me Crispin. I'm like, what? Why is he doing that? Anyway. Wow. Um, um, I, I thank you. I mean, like Danik and I, like that's something that she and I like are really into is like special effects makeup. Like on Tuesday, we actually had two people from the show Face Off, um, which is a special effects, you know, competition show on here. And so I'm just so like, I think that's so neat that you got to go through. I mean, I'm sure sitting there for four hours at a time isn't the most pleasurable experience, but it certainly paid off. So, well, yeah. And, and it's, it was kind of the uh, price to pay to, you know, to be in the in the show. You know, I, I just you know took it in stride as best I could. I remember when I did my screen test, they wanted to see if that young age makeup was working, and I remember Bob Gale, or no, it was Bob Zemeckis and uh, Dean Cundy, the cinematographer, were at my test, and and Bob Z asked Dean, "What do you think?" And and Dean said, "I think we got Crispin without the trouble." And <laughs> okay, uh, but shooting right next door was uh, Warren Beatty. Uh, directing Dick Tracy, oh. and William William Forsythe came over as uh, was out uh, hanging out the trailer uh, as Flat Top, and and who else was there? It was it Dustin Hoffman as Moonface? Anyway, a couple of the, those actors were there, and I was looking at their makeup, going, "Wow, this is incredible!" And their the costumes were so bright and everything, and they're looking at me saying, "What the hell are you supposed to be?" <laughs> really nice give and take. Right now. <laughs> okay, so. Um as much as I hate to segue away from uh, Back to the Future, I think we shall. Uh, and one of the things that we had, um, one of the things that we had spoken about before we started this today was one of my favorite artists of all time, who is Alice Cooper. And you have the opportunity, what is it, to be brainwashed by a Mr. Cooper? Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, I think I sent a photo of me, although it's not a great shot. Uh, well, you know, my, my parents never wanted me to be an actor. Uh, they they worked around a lot of actors, and uh, my mom was even a bail bonds woman, and bailed Lenny Bruce and other celebrities out of jail. And I, <laughs> so they, they knew what a tough life that could be. Uh, um, but I was determined to do it. So right out of high school, finally on my own, uh, I signed up to do uh, kind of background work on films, just to get on big studio lots. I wanted to see what it was all about, and r instead of just making films with my friends at school and such. So. Uh, I signed up with this company that sent me to play uh, Strawberry Fields' brother in that big balloon scene in Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, mm -hmm. and uh, and you can't really see me at all in it. It's you know the focus is mainly on Peter and and the Bee Gees uh, taking off in the balloon. But then I got called back to do another scene, which was the "Got to Get You Into My Life" concert scene with Earth, Wind, and Fire. I thought, wow, this is. Kind of cool. I've always wanted to see Earth, Wind, and Fire, and uh, so I'm 18, right? And I get a call. They they want you back on the Sergeant Pepper's. I'm like, great. And it looks like it's gonna be multiple days. I was like, really? What are we doing? And it's well, you're gonna be, get brainwashed by Alice Cooper. I was like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I, my sister and I, you know, we had the Killer album and used to dance our butts off in our bedrooms and and uh, just loved it. You know, all through Billion Dollar Babies, and I, I was a big. Alice Mann when I was uh, in those days. I, I kind of lost it around Muscle of Love. I didn't. Oh, I, okay. From there on, I stopped following Alice so much. But on uh, Sergeant Pepper's, uh, you know, uh, worked three days on this one scene where I'm sort of dressed as like a Boy Scout with a bunch of other uh, uh, dancers, mostly dancers that we're, we're uh, working with. We had these little stupid uh, <laughs> movements you know with while well, alice is up on the big screen singing and there are two two dancers on either side of the screen that alice is on alice isn't there in person but he's on the screen so i figure he's in another studio being projected in or something um and i i was i was really kind of you know crushed like there i am i'm ah. i'm the one in there um and and there was this blonde dancer who i thought was so cute and i i kind of asserted myself and introduced myself and started hanging around her. And by the second day, um, she and I went to lunch off, off the MGM lot uh, and she bought me a beer. You know, I think it's only 18. I was like, oh, this is cool. And <laughs> was kind of, you know, crush-like on her. And uh, the third day, you know, the rumor was going around, Alice is going to be here today. Alice is going to be, I was like, far out. So first thing in the morning after getting on costume and makeup, I, I go and I find this girl, Cheryl, and I, I go right up to her at the front of the set 
And she's like, Jeffrey, hey, I want you to meet my husband, Alice. <laughs> oh, <hi. laughs> I had a feeling that's where it's going. <laughs> I love that so much. And they're still together. I mean, it's just like they oh, are it's so wonderful. Glorious. Yeah. yeah, and Cheryl, Cheryl's so kind and wonderful and sweet as well. Yeah. And I've I've run into Alice a few times. Um, I uh, went to high school with Terry Nunn of Berlin, mm. and uh, <laughs> dated a little bit. And uh, she invited me to be in uh, a couple of the rock videos, and then came and I sang on their background on their third album, Count Three and Pray, I think it is. And uh, and Alice was in the studio right next door, and so I went over and I said, "Hey, uh, do, I, I, do I call you Vincent?" I said, Alice. <laughs> Alice. Alice. <laughs> Alice. I, and I tried to, you know, bring up uh, uh, Sergeant Pepper's, and I was like, "I can't go down this road because it's because <laughs> I'm crushing on his wife." And I, you know, I had the same thing happen with Donna Dixon uh, on Twilight Zone movie. I, I, she had just broken up with whoever she was dating from KISS. And she and I hit it off right right away and she really confided a lot in me and so on and so forth. And I was out on the outs with my current girlfriend. I was like just about to ask her to go out. And I think it was at the rap party of that she met Dan Aykroyd, who she's still <laughs> married to. You know, I, my timing. <laughs> but impeccable you know, I a, taste. I, I, I actually, <laughs> I uh, married my, my junior high school sweetheart now. We, we both had previous marriages, but uh, I re-met her after 20 years and we've been together since 93, 94. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. See, I love we, a happy ending. We did children's theater. Uh, in fact, it, it, one of the reasons I'm working with the Cabinet of Oddities, the Actors Gang, is Lee Ehrenberg, my friend who was in the children's theater with us, uh, helped found the Actors Gang with Tim and my friend Ron Rosen and such. Oh, so cool. Lovely. Yeah. So, uh, Danica, why don't you ask one more of your questions and then we'll play the game. Uh -oh. All right. So um, being that I am also a, a big theater person, I'm a, a director by day, um, I have to ask you a little bit of uh, some sort of nerdy theater stuff here. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've noticed that you are a fan of Commedia. Commedia dell'arte. Oh, sì. yes. Oh, I, I so even, my, my big question then... Mm -hmm. is, um, I mean, not everybody, of course, knows Soak Media with uh, all of the stock characters where we get, like, Punch and Judy, and, and I mean, you name it, comedy comes from Comedia. So, Comedia. <laughs> either way you slice it. So, I was curious, what is your favorite Comedia character to teach or play or well, anything? Well, for, for, for folks who don't know, Comedia started 800 years ago. The, the church forbade... Uh, theatrical productions. The theaters were all closed down. The only way you could do a, a stage show was if it was a morality play mm -hmm. or passion play. Mm -hmm. And after several hundred years of that, uh, the Italians said enough already and they started performing in the streets off their carts and creating these stock characters a Pantalone and a Arlecchino and so on and so forth. And those stock characters that have corresponding masks, uh, I have a few in the other room I could get, but- um, How cool. Those those stock characters have come down to us. If you look at like Gilligan's Island, Gilligan is Arlecchino, Skipper is is Capitano, uh, uh, Thurston Howell is Pantalone, uh, Ginger is is uh, uh, what's her name, um, Cortazania, uh, and and uh, you know Colombina could be Mrs. Howell, I guess, mm -hmm. but there. And the professore is the professor, you know, uh, El Dottore, rather, is the professor. So, and and in SpongeBob SquarePants, you know, Mr. Crab is, who likes the money? Pantalone. You know, uh, so I guess I, I like uh, so many of the characters. It's hard for me to, to pin one down. I've, I've played Arlecchino. I've played Pedro Lino, who is the Arlecchino of the moon. I've played... Uh, 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 Puccinella. Puccinella is the hunchback with the tall sugar loaf hat who, uh, his, his name Puccinella Titrullo translates the stupid little chicken. Uh, and they, they all come from different regions, regions uh, or originate from different regions of Italy. And of course those regions th think their characters are better. You know, uh, I love the, the wonderfulness of, of Il Dottore because he knows 
everything he thinks. And he goes on and spouts for hours and hours and hours about everything. But he's <laughs> speaking mumbo jumbo. It's so fun. Uh, and Pantalone, who, you know, is money grabbing and is always, you know, flirting with the ladies and <laughs> thinks he's lecherous, he's nasty. He's a let go. <laughs> Brigella, Brigella is a great Brigella one. Brigella is great. Yeah, yeah he's, he's he gets away with murder. He's a real pirate. He's the real deal, but he's funny at the same time, and he plays music and sings. You know, there's a lot of great characters. It's hard for me to pin down one. Uh, and what are your feelings? I a nerdiness abounds, but uh, Trafalgno versus Arlecchino. Well, was Trafald Trafalgno? Trafalgno, I don't know. He's See, basically, yeah, so I, I recently, recently, three years ago, directed um, The Servant of Two Masters, which is um, basically a love letter to Commedia. So, <laughs> so Truffaldino, Truffaldino is like, is the lead. of. Oh, that. I see, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, you know, he's I basically are I saw the uh, Piccolo Teatro Milano, you know, the, the troupe that Dario Fo and, and uh, Jacques Le Lecoq uh, mm -hmm. started in Milan. They came during the 84 Olympics and then they came again and did that show that that oh, they've been in media for over 60 years. And they did that show in Italian. And it, you didn't need the translation. You understood oh, yeah. everything just by the way they performed in their physicalization. It was delicious. Uh, but I, if I knew more, I, I, you know, I don't know. I think Arlecchino's the, the winner on that. Mm, I like it. Good. Correct. I mean, they're all good answers. <laughs> <laughs> I was so pressured. <laughs> okay, so Jeffrey, we have a game that we're going to play. This is a game of Would You Rather. So there is <laughs> <laughs> there, there's no wrong answers. And okay. um, if you want to elaborate on why you picked one of the answers, that's great. If not, that's great too. So this is our game of Would You Rather. And let's bring up this graphic. Okay, so Would You Rather... <laughs> Go to Cafe 80s or watch Jaws 19. Oh, brother. <laughs> I would prefer to watch John, Jaws 19. Okay. But but you would think by then they would know to stay out of the water, right? Yeah, but uh, this looks like a land shark. Oh. <laughs> land shark. All right. <laughs> Candy cane. <girl>. Okay. <laughs> All right. Would you rather always wear Charlie Chaplin's hat or always wear the Groucho Marx mustache. Oh, brother! Uh, I've I've spent days all day wearing both of those. Um, hmm. Hmm. You know, I, I when when I play Charlie, like I mentioned, I started playing Charlie in 1989, 88, and I started playing Groucho in '89. So it was '88 Charlie and put together Groucho and. Uh, yeah. So I've been playing them for a long, long time and I play them all day at the theme parks and they, I get to a point where the character kind of takes over. And as Charlie, I get away with murder. I, I get away with kicking old ladies in the butt and, <laughs> and, and you know, and, uh, or, or picking up little children by the hair. Although I'm not, you know, I have, I make sure they're holding my arm. So, but it looks like I'm pulling them up, holding them by the hair and people flip, um, you know, I, I've had so much fun. In fact, if you go to Charlie Chaplin tribute Weissman on YouTube, you'll see me uh, opening for the Western Stunt Show on a 105 degree day or something. It's really miserable in front of 3,000 people. So that's a good example of my Charlie. My Groucho, you can see on Vimeo, I did a Harris New Year's Eve gig uh, eight years ago or so, and I'm singing for mostly Filipinos who probably don't even know Groucho that well, but I'm singing Lydia the Tattooed Lady and doing all my jokes and everything. And with Groucho, I get away with so much. Um, my my wife doesn't like it so much when I play Groucho because she thinks I'm so mean. <laughs> then you're. Well, uh, are you familiar with the um, the brotherhood? I, I guess I'll call it between Alice Cooper and Groucho Marx. Yeah, they, yeah, they were good friends. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so cool. And it, you know, I, I through the years have been very fortunate. I got to meet uh, Groucho's nephew you know robert marx zeppo's son and and bill marx harpo's son and you know i got kind of the stamp of approval they loved my groucho which was really lovely and uh and then you know playing stan laurel i became friends with lois laurel and uh, the late lois laurel and her late husband tony haas and, and they gave me the stamp of approval and i'd, I'd go to the international conventions 
representing Stanley and uh, was even with Hal Roach at his centennial playing Stan. And anyway, it's been very rewarding for me. Before I fell into that work, I didn't, I knew of Laurel Hardy and Charlie Chaplin and Groucho Marx, but I didn't necessarily appreciate them like I do now because I had to dive into their work. And then now I'm like nuts over their work. And, and then others like Lapino Lane or Charlie Chase, you know, people that uh, who are incredibly wonderful talents who have been a good, good deal forgotten by the masses. Awesome. I also want to mention, I was watching uh, one of your YouTube videos where it was the Three Stooges. That one was fabulous too. <laughs> yes. Uh, I Not that long ago, probably, uh, well, maybe around uh, 2000 or so, uh, started playing Larry Fine. And uh, it's, it's amazing that that fan base is super strong. They, when it, when I perform in front of the fans, I know I'm going to be, be heavily scrutinized. So you got to get it right. And, you know, I have sort of the bald cap and the hair out the here. And um, I don't know if I, if I send it to you, I have a shot of me with my Stooges team up here in North, Northern California, uh, bringing Iggy Pop's uh, 60th birthday cake out to him backstage at the Warfield. Oh. And, uh, you know, Iggy was high from his performance. He was so amazing at 60 years old, you know, crowd surfing and doing his, his stupid <laughs> show. And he comes off, you know, high from the show and sweaty. And we've got the, the cake singing happy birthday. And he goes, oh, look, it's clowns. And I say, we're stooges, you idiot. You know, as Larry. And uh, he goes, oh, yeah. And I, then I got to spend a, you know, a good half hour chatting with Iggy in his dressing room. It was just, it was magic for me because I'm a big fan of, I, I was a DJ and, <laughs> or still DJ once a while, and love good music, which Iggy has given us plenty. That he has. Oh, man. OK, here's the next would you rather. Would you rather live in a Big Brother home situation with the cast of Pale Rider, or live in a Big Brother home situation with the cast of Back to the Future Part 2 and 3? Uh, can you point of order? Uh, in Big Brother situation? So a Big Brother situation is you you live in a house where there's cameras, they're just kind of watching you. It's like, oh. a, like, like a reality um, TV situation. And each yeah. week you have to vote someone out of the house. Ah, hmm. Ooh, that's, that's a tough one. The, you know, Pale Rider, we got snowed in by a blizzard during that shoot on location on Per Diem. And people like Chris, they're like great Chris Penn, you know, kind of went off his nut at one point and <clears throat> Clint had to bail him out. Michael Moriarty quit the film at one point because he broke fingers that shouldn't have gotten broken. And Carrie Snodgrass almost quit a few times. And I, that was, that was a wonderful, wonderful cast to play with. But, uh, and, and I think I would probably go more big brother with the back to the future cast because they seem a little more, um, I want to say tame or, uh, not, uh, yeah, I don't know. I love both casts, and you got Fair me on enough. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah you, you, you just you can't vote out Clint Eastwood. Like, you just yeah. – <laughs> like yeah. So, you know, when we talk about catering, uh, Clint uh, fired the caterer, I remember, early into the shoot out there in Idaho on the mountaintop. And the next day, I, I had uh, just flown my ex-wife in uh, to visit while we were shooting, and a blizzard hit us while we were shooting with a new caterer on top of this mountaintop. And it was just Clint, my ex-wife and I having lunch together. And the new caterer was serving steak and lobster in the middle of this blizzard. <laughs> Sounds delicious. That was good catering on that. Oh, I <laughs> believe. <laughs> All right, let's do our next one. All right, ooh, ooh. would you rather have to improv opposite Dan Aykroyd or improv opposite Steve Martin? Oh, brother. <laughs> Oh man! We try not to make them easy. <laughs> I think I would probably want to uh, uh, opposite Dan Aykroyd because Steve likes to drive. Mm. I think Steve mm. likes to win in improv, yeah. and, okay. it, and 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 Aykroyd doesn't need to win. And when when no one's trying to win, it goes mm. a lot farther and has better story. Ooh, that's a good point. Ooh, it, yeah. yeah. I, yeah, all unfortunately, right. we didn't get it get it get into all of the uh, the improv stuff as much as yes. we would have wanted. To we'll have to do a but part yeah, two. Oh yeah. <laughs> all right. Here's the next one. Would you rather live in the Wild West or live in Biff Tannen's future? Okay. 
I'd take the, the Wild West on that one. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next All one. All right. Next one. Would and if, you rather... you know, if I'm, in yes. Biff, if I'm uh, still playing George in Biff's, I get murdered, you know, or I'm dead already. Yeah, it's well. well. <laughs> no, it's not ideal. <laughs> All right, our next one. Would you rather swim with sharks or go skydiving? <laughs> Can I skydive with a shark? That's uh, Jaws 20. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think I think it's gonna be skydiving. I think it's gonna be skydiving, uh, but my acrophobia is not pretty. Um <sighs> And yeah. even even if I'm in a cage around the sharks, it's still gonna. I it's gotta no. Like, the water's okay. gonna get a little warm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. I mean, I'm I'm right there with you on both counts, so I wouldn't have push, an answer. Push me out of a plane. Here I go. All right, here's the next one. Would you rather? Star I guess being underwater, being underwater, you you would see the yellow. Uh, skydiving, you wouldn't see me through my pants so much. Uh, okay. Yes, of course. <laughs> people that are dropping after you might. <laughs> the all-important <laughs> pee pants factor. Okay. Uh, <laughs> would you rather star in a reboot of the first movie you ever remember watching Ooh. or star in a sequel to the most recent film that you watched? Wow. Hmm. Probably the reboot. Because I, I, I want to say uh, when I saw The Seven Faces of Dr. Lau, I was really impressed with what Tony Randall did in it, playing all those roles, and it freaked my shit out. I remember having uh, nightmares over it, but I would wouldn't mind the challenge of playing all those multiple roles in that. That was so. If you haven't seen it, it's quite wonderful. the The last film I saw uh, was was a, a Sir Derek Jacobi in The Fool, which is a period piece, which I love as well. Um, but I I kind of do that at the Dickens Fair when we're not on, in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Playing okay. Victorian characters. Well, okay. All right, I think this is our last one. All right, would you rather have a time traveling DeLorean or have a time traveling train? Oh boy, probably the time traveling train. All my DeLorean owner friends are probably going to be pissed at me, but the train has <laughs> got uh, hopefully a, a dining car. Uh, more room to move. I'm a, I'm a little claustrophobic. You saw that picture of me in the Dorian monster truck. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was able to handle that. Uh, and I can handle a DeLorean if I'm driving, I found out. A friend mm -hmm. who owns one finally got me behind the wheel of one, and I was okay. Otherwise, I feel claustrophobic when that wing comes down. I'm like, hey, hey, <laughs> So the train, and then maybe we'll get some good catering, some steak and lobster, yeah, that's yeah, good. like Clint. That's a good point. Yeah, if, if you have me back on, I'll talk about Twilight Zone movie uh, and how my cla claustrophobic, how, how my claustrophobia uh, was developed there in that oh, mother from Cat Scratch Fever. Oh, good. All right. I mean, we, we'd love to have you back. Uh, I mean, we just yeah, hit an okay. hour. This, of course, flew by. We barely scratched mm -hmm. the surface. But I guess well, before we wrap up, let's call it Part one, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. I thought we were going to talk about Igor. Okay, forget it. Let, no, let's talk about Igor. We have, listen, if you ain't got nowhere to be, let's talk about Igor because, you know, young Frankenstein, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is another one of Danica and my favorite films. So um, have you, <laughs> along your um, journey, have you ever had the chance to meet Mel Brooks in person or um, just out of curiosity? Uh, I met Mel about four, four or five times. Hey, look at that picture! Oh, that's so good. Um, <laughs> I, I was, I was doing a show in Hollywood when, it, when I was uh, still a senior in high school, and I ran into him at a restaurant. I even sat. I was bold enough to sit at his table without being invited. That was so, that was so stupid of me, but I was so impressed because I wanted to tell him a story that I had completely forgot because I was starstruck. Does that make sense? Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> we know the feeling well. Yeah. Uh, I guess I have to flash back because the story began when I was 14, I think. It was in 70, I want to say 74, whatever. Um, I, I had heard Mel was in, in our neighborhood shooting a film. And uh, so I didn't, rather than take the bus home, I walked home. And uh, through the Santa Monica Promenade, I started seeing 
people in Victorian evening wear. I was like, oh, this must be the film. It must be around here. And I was doing shows, uh, you know, in junior high and high school already, so I could recognize actors pretty much. And there was one gentleman in a top hat whose whose mustache was flapping. I was like, excuse me, sir, your mustache is coming up. And he goes, oh, is it? <laughs> Who are you? I said, well, I'm an actor. And he says, really? Tell me, what have you done? And I said, well, I was in Merchant of Venice. I was in Dark of the Moon. I was, you know, and he said, really? You want to meet Mel? I said, Brooks, yes. He said, come with me. So we went to the Mayfair Music Hall, and uh, there was the camera truck, and, and outside were chairs, and Peter Boyle in the monster, the creature makeup was sitting in one. And there was Marty Feldman right there in his hat, uh, and he was in street clothes, but he was wearing a merce. I remember <laughs> I was quite impressed that he was wearing a male bag. And uh, which I I I wear one now, um, and, and and I used to watch you know the Marty Feldman show, and so I was just thrilled to meet him and meet Peter Boyle and his the shades of green of the creature makeup I thought was incredible. When he came out in black and white, I was like, oh no, you can't see the wonderful green. Anyway, so we go inside where Mel is uh, directing the putting on the Ritz number, and uh, and my friend who I became friends with this this extra this. A professional extra named Ray Wallach, whose mustache was flapping. Uh, he says, Mel, Mel, you got to want to meet this kid. And, and and Mel kind of goes by and says, I have no time for kids. <laughs> Off he went. Well, so uh, a number of years later, um, while working at, at Universal, there wasn't a fanny pack. Uh, <laughs> It was a merce. It's like a, a man's purse. We have to give a shout out to Charles, uh, our friend Milo Beasley, who also hosts one of these shows. He is a mega, mega, mega Back to the Future franchise fan. So I know he is excited to be all. watching this right now. <laughs> yeah. Ah, there it is. It's one of these. Oh, that is a good I'm looking her. merce. Yeah. Oh, it's leather. Yeah. Yeah. Stylish. I like it. So uh, while well, I. Working at Universal, uh, uh, in 83, I worked on Johnny Dangerously with Michael Keaton. Mm -hmm. And my scene also had Dom DeLuise in it. And Dom and I got along great during that. And Dom remembered me when he started working at Universal doing the new Candid Camera. Yeah. And when he saw me as Charlie Chaplin, uh, he flipped. And when he saw me as, as Groucho or, or uh, Stan Laurel, he flipped. And he insisted that my partner and I, as Laurel and Hardy, would always warm up his crowd at the tapings of his Candid Camera. So then a few years later, I'm at the silent movie house watching a Buster Keaton festival and Dom comes and brings his friends. His best friend was Ann Bancroft, uh, mm -hmm. Mel's wife. And there is Mel and Ann and Dom. And during the break, uh, you know, Ann likes to have her sick smoke. And I went out there and to say hi to Dom. And he was like, Mel, Ann, oh, this is my friend, Jeffrey. You know, to see Stan Laurel, Charlie Chaplin, and Grouch Marks, you think they're there? And, and I said, well, actually, Mr. Brooks, we've met before my Marx Brothers team auditioned for a Robin Hood Men in Tights. And Mel oh, tight. oh, I remember you guys. I liked you guys. I will have to cut them from that banquet scene because the actor playing Don Corleone asked for too much money. <laughs> the light went off uh, because I realized that Dom played Don Corleone. And I turned to Dom and I started strangling him. Because he got us that job. I freaking love that movie. Wow. <laughs> So just a few years back, uh, I was offered the role of, uh, you saw the picture there of me mm -hmm. as uh, Igor, Igor in Young Frankenstein, the musical, uh, which, you know, it's been a while since I tap danced, so I wasn't great at the tap dancing, but I tried to get back on that horse. Uh, oh, my wife said I was great. And I was in 12, <laughs> Thank I was in 12 numbers as Igor and, and uh, really tried to do my tribute to Marty and to Mel and Worked my tail out. In fact, that, that cast was stellar. A really, really lovely talent across the boards in that that production. It's amazing. Yeah, I was gonna actually say, um, it's probably oh gosh, it's so hard to pick like a favorite like script or play or film from from Mel. But my my dad and I at my wedding, we danced to um, Putting on the Ritz, which was like we we started <laughs> dancing to uh, Unforgettable, and everyone's like, ah. And then we did a record scratch, and then we did the whole thing, and uh, oh, it was wow. so cute. It was so cute. Go, but, 
But okay, so um, I'm gonna take note to ask the next time that we have you on about the Twilight Zone story about your claustrophobia, I will take note. But before we wrap this up, is there any final thoughts that you wanna leave us with here today? Well, it's it's just been lovely. Thank you for, uh, you know, I kind of nudged and said, hey, have me on and, and you responded. So We're so warmly. glad that you did. This was like, you don't this understand. This is yeah, very exciting this. for us. We love you. This yeah. is wonderful. This and is great. You gotta, you gotta keep doing what you're doing. It's so wonderful for you know fans who can't get to a Comic-Con to uh, people who are, I mean, it's just the suffering, the unnecessary fucking suffering that's going on right now. Uh, yeah. You know, the mm -hmm. stupid administration that's going out that uh, probably are responsible for over a couple hundred thousand unnecessary deaths. Um, it's a heartbreaking time right now. And uh, what you're doing is is lightening the load in a way. And, and uh, you know, I just pray that everyone stays healthy, safe, and compassionate. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, Danica and I enjoy this because, you know, she's my best friend. She lives in, in Houston. I'm in Miami. And we get to virtually hang out all the time now. Yeah. You know, more so than... Now we have to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm uh, probably... I, I'm under... I think I'm contracted to be at Pensacon still. Oh, fabulous. Okay, um, that's February, I believe. At the end that's of February. Of... I've I, I got to get the vaccine before I'll be comfortable. My wife had brain cancer, and she's at risk. Oh, so I don't I can't bring okay. anything home. Mm -hmm. So I've I got to play that gently. Um, and, you know, I've had two films and one TV pilot all, you know, the plug pulled because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I just uh, got a grant, as I mentioned before. I'm, I'm growing this out to, to my mustache to, to be Mark Twain again. So I'm developing Mark Twain's American History, uh, oh, yay. to, uh, to tell history through uh, Twain's eyes. Um, so I'm, I'm developing that to be a Zoom show for uh, homeschoolers and public school kids, teachers who want to use it. Uh, so I'm working on that. Luckily, my first job since the pandemic. That's brilliant. That's, I love that's that. really cool. Yeah. yeah. If, if oh. anyone wants to be in touch, follow me on Twitter at J E F Weissman, W E I S S M A N, on Instagram at Jeffrey J Weissman, on Facebook, Jeffrey Weissman Actor, and JeffreyWeissman.com. And I have photos and Pizza Hut wrappers that I can sign, you know, just in time for Christmas. Um, oh, there you go. And I always throw in extras. Fabulous. Oh, well, uh, before we wrap this up, Danica, you want to go over our upcoming weeks ahead? Let's we have. do it. All right. So this coming Tuesday, we have Casey Jost. He's from Impractical Jokers. The following Tuesday after that, the 29th, we have Mr. Jonah Ray. From Mystery Science Theta 3000. Nice. <laughs> and on January 5th, we have Mr. Roger Clark. The actor from Red Dead 2. <laughs> On January 12th, we have the incomparable Jimbo. She is from Canada's, or Canada's Drag Race. <laughs> Canada. Canada. We love our neighbors to the north. <laughs> and then on January 14th, we've got Mr. Glenn Sobel, who we've seen before, and he's rocking. And Jeffrey, he is the drummer for Alice Cooper. Mm -hmm. Right on. Mm -hmm. On January 26th, we've got the wonderful Lucas Rossi. Singer, songwriter, and we're hopefully also going to have Icarus Bell. I'm putting it out in the universe. Yes. If they're watching, we hope they come back. But anyway, Jeffrey, you've been an absolute like saint. You're an angel. We really appreciate your time. Your stories are so lovely. Thank you for sharing them with us. And I had a lovely time, too. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you for part two soon. Love it. Awesome. I'll see you in the future. <laughs> Sounds great. All right, guys. Be safe, everybody. Wear your mask, guys. Wear your mask and be safe. Bye, guys. Bye. Oh, what?